Well, welcome to step three of the growth track. Uh, thank you for continuing on this process and on this journey. And again, let me encourage everybody to complete all four steps of the growth track. You're going to be really glad that you did. Today, we're going we're gonna to talk about this idea of developing your leadership. So let me just take a minute and just review where we've been. So we started with step one, becoming a member, just sharing the vision, uh, of what we feel like is God's vision from the Bible for every, every person. Uh, God wants everyone to know him personally. And so as a church, we're saying that we exist to help people come to know Jesus Christ not just in their head, but in their heart. So that, that is the purpose of our organization. We want lost people found. God's, God wants lost people found. We do that primarily through our weekend services. We partner together to, to invest in lost people, and uh, together we're winning our friends, our coworkers, our, our family members uh, to the Lord, but we're also invested around the world. Now, after you are saved and you're following Jesus, you know God. That second step we call find freedom. And the idea is that now I'm out of Egypt. Now I got to get Egypt out of me. I got to start aligning my thinking with God's thinking. I got to deal with my past and, uh, and begin to be transformed uh, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We think that primarily happens best in groups or small groups. And so we want everybody to be a part of a group because as I am working out my issues, you know, in groups, I'm studying the Bible, I'm studying, I'm, I'm, I'm developing relationships with other people. And while I'm doing that, I'm working out the issues of my past. And I know some of you might be saying, Pastor, I don't have an issue. Well, that's probably your issue, <laughs> is that you think you don't have an issue. We all have issues. And so uh, we grow best in the, in, the pro, in the context of relationships. And so we want everybody to be in a small group uh, all the time. Our third step is uh, God wants everyone to discover their purpose. And of course, that was what our last session was, was all about, discovering our design. And around here, we believe that our design reveals our destiny. And so uh, God created us all uniquely as individuals with different gifts and talents and abilities and experiences. And together, uh, that gives us an idea of our shape or, or how we're shaped for ministry. And hopefully in the last session, you, you learned a lot about yourself. And, and just give you an idea of what's going to happen after this is after the growth track is over, uh, you'll be contacted by, by our leaders here, and they'll either have an in-person interview or a, Zoom, or a Zoom interview or a phone call, and you'll just kind of talk through uh, you know, your shape profile and the ministry opportunities that are available, and again, try to put you on a team that is uh, connected to your dream. Now, let me say, uh, the next session, step four, is we're gonna have some of our dream team leaders present, and we'll talk through, I think there are about 30 or more different ministry teams or dream teams you can be part of. But let's say you say, hey, that, none of those teams are basically what I have in mind uh, as far as what what's I'm really passionate about. I've got some really good news. How about you start that new team, that thing that, is, that you are passionate about? I think there are some dream teams that don't exist yet because you're not leading them yet, and God has uniquely shaped you for that. And so uh, share that with us. We'll help you. We'll, we'll come alongside and resource you because we believe that as we, uh, as we partner with you in fulfilling your dream, you're also fulfilling the dream of the church, okay? And so uh, that brings us to today here in step three, and we want to talk about developing your leadership. Now, right out of the gate, I don't want you to get hung up on that word, leadership. Because some people think, well, pastor, I'm not a leader. Well, uh, leadership is, is a word, it literally means influence. And, and what it means is we all have influence. Some people have a lot of influence. Some people don't have as much influence, but we all have influence. And because of that, we're all leaders. And of course, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. And so we've been given gifts to serve other people, to bless other people, to influence other people. And, so, and of course, the scripture says, use them well to serve yourself. Are you paying attention? 
because that's not what it says. Use them well to serve one another, all right? And so God has shaped us, he's designed us, he's created us uh, to make a difference in the lives of other people. That's called leadership, and that's why all of us can confidently say today, I am, I am a leader. I am a leader. And, and this is in your book, and you can follow along, but leadership is about influencing others in a worthwhile cause. It's not dependent on titles or positions. So, you know, in order to have influence in other people, I don't have to have the title that says director of this or team leader of that. No, uh, it, it's dependent on people discovering their gifts and passions and then using them to make a difference in the lives of other people. And so our dream as a church is that we are a church full of people who are using their gifts, their experiences, their skills to make a difference in the lives of other people. Now, I want you to picture for a minute what that could be like when there is a church full of people who are committed to making a difference in the lives of the people around them. I think everything begins to change. Church becomes very exciting because now I'm not just coming for me and just solely focused on me as a consumer of religious goods or services, but now as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I realize that God made me on purpose for a purpose and I'm making a difference in the lives of people around me. I'm preaching again, but that's the vision that God wants uh, for all of us. So what stands in the way? What keeps people from stepping into using their gifts and their talents? What, what keeps people from stepping into uh, the opportunity to influence other people? Well, I think uh, if we use Moses as an example, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, Moses, remember, was called by God to deliver the people out of bondage. Uh, remember the questions that Moses asked God at the burning bush. Uh, he, his first question was, who am I? Moses is like, you want me to do what? <laughs> you want me to lead a, a few million people out of Egypt? Me? You know, I, he says, I'm a stutterer. He goes, I'm, and, and basically, I think the challenge for a lot of us is insecurity. We don't want to step into leadership because, because we're insecure about who we are or where, or where we came from. And, and I think all of us deal with this at, at some level, you know, basically, who am I? But all we have to do is look at the Bible and realize the people that God used to do great things, many times were a bunch of nobodies, right? Uh, why did God use a murderer <laughs> to write two-thirds of the New Testament? But that's what he did. Why did God use an adulterer to write a lot of the book of Psalms? That's what David did, right? So it's, it's almost as if God chose imperfect people on purpose, right? So when we say we're insecure, who am I? God, God, God gives us grace. And, and Moses said, what if they, you know, but what if they don't listen? What if that? And that's, and that's fear. Sometimes we, uh, we don't want to step into leadership because we're afraid. What if they don't like me? What if I don't do very good? What if I fail? And, and we have to overcome our fear and rely on the grace of God. And then Moses says, well, I've never done that. And, and the issue is inadequacy. I, I've never done that before. I've never led a group before. I've never served on a team at church before. I've always just gone to church. Why are you expecting me to do that? And we're like, well, we're inadequate. Well, I, I want to encourage you. I've never pastored a church like this before. You know, I grew up in a small, I grew up in small churches. The largest church I ever attended my whole life was a couple hundred people. So I've, I've never done what I'm doing right now. And I think that's actually a good thing because there is this beauty of inadequacy where we're constantly having to rely on the Lord. God wants us to rely on him, his power, his spirit, to stay humble, to stay before the Lord. Does that make sense, everybody? And so uh, that, that actually helps us. Our inadequacy actually helps us to rely on Jesus for what we need to do. And then uh, Moses says, why don't you just use somebody else? Hey, somebody else can do it. And because of that, we're reluctant. And of course, hopefully we've learned by now that there is no other you. There is no other person like you. And that you were created by God on purpose, for a purpose. There are certain needs that only you can meet. 
God needs you. God wants you. God wired you, shaped you, molded you to meet needs. And so let me, let me put a little pressure on you, but I'm saying it with a smile. And because I love you, there are people's needs that won't get met unless you step forward using your gifts, talents, and shape to meet those needs. So God wants to use you to be part of it. And this is really good because in the New Testament, God puts it this way. You are a chosen generation. Everybody say chosen. You are chosen by God, a royal priesthood. Now, I I said earlier in step one that this part of discovering your purpose is is also known uh, as the priesthood of the believer. So the idea is in the Old Testament, the priests were the people who went to God on behalf of the people But in the New Testament, the Bible says we're all kings and priests. So it's not me being the priest, you know, and I do all the ministry and you guys sit and watch. No, the Bible says now we're all kings and priests. We're all called to serve. We're all called to bless. We're all called to give and be a part of that. And so uh, hopefully so far we've, we've done a good job of convincing you that we are saved to serve. I am created by God to serve other people and really That's the highest level of fulfillment. Did you know that sociologists have created this steps, this uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that the most basic need is food and air and water and those types of things. But the the most uh, most, uh, powerful need meeting part is when we're actually making a difference in the lives of other people. That's ultimate fulfillment. And, and so can I tell you that that's, I think that's why a lot of people struggle. They struggle with their life. They're, they're bored. They're, they're, they're discouraged. Some are depressed and, and they're feeling empty because God made them on purpose for a purpose, but they're not using what they have to serve other people. God says, You're, you are wired to make a difference for other people. This is when life gets really exciting. When I'm not living for myself, I'm living for other people. It's pretty awesome. And so I want to spend the next few minutes, and I want to talk to you about, about leadership culture, okay? So when you join the team, and I'm just going to go, on a, go ahead and say by faith that all you are going to join a team uh, when this is over, what, is, what does leadership look like? What is it that you want everyone on the team to do? This is what I'm about to teach you is something that, that we teach our staff our paid staff, and, and of course, if you join the Dream Team, you're gonna be part of our volunteer staff as well. And, and I think it, it really starts when we look at the life of Daniel in the Old Testament. I think Daniel's a great example because he was serving God in a, in a country and in a time where uh, people weren't serving God. But look at what the Bible says. It pleased Darius, this uh, foreign leader that Daniel served, to appoint 120 satraps, and that's like mayors or, or area leaders. So it's like a government position. Uh, so it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So you got the king, and then you got these three assistants to the king, and those three people oversee the whole kingdom, and Daniel's one of those three people. So the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. And uh, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now this is really good because the Bible says that Daniel made a choice, that he was going to distinguish himself. And, and, and so it wasn't because of what the gifts and talents that Daniel was born with. He made a choice that he is going to use his leadership to serve the king well. And, and what his choice was, he was going to have some exceptional qualities. And so what I'm trying to tell you uh, today is that when you join the team, when you're part of a dream team here at Grace, these are the four exceptional qualities that we want everybody to pursue. Now, you're going to see when we walk through these here in just a minute that you're going to be naturally inclined 
uh, in one or more of these, but you're also going to be needing to work on maybe one or more, okay? But these are the goals that we want everybody who's serving on our team, exceptional qualities to pursue. And the first one is, on our team, we love God. We love God. Now, what that means is the best thing that I can offer as a dream team member at Grace is that I actually have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm reading the Bible. I'm praying. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm in a group. I'm growing. I'm developing my relationship with God and other people because when I have that, that's the very best thing that I can serve other people with, that the Spirit of God is in me. Uh, In Acts chapter 4, Remember, the Bible says they saw the courage of Peter and John. This is after Jesus had, had, had arose and ascended to heaven. So here they are. They saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. And I think this is so funny because the Greek word here is idiotes. It's where we get the word idiot. They were a bunch of idiots. The Bible says it, they didn't have a lot of A lot of academic knowledge. They weren't very well trained, but they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So let me tell you, it's great if you have academic training. It's great if you have an incredible knowledge, but the most important thing about you is that you be with Jesus. And you're just, there's life there. There's there's joy there. There's grace there. How How many know there's a difference When you're around somebody who spends time with Jesus and somebody who's not, right? And so what we want is is the life-giving spirit of God to be on you. Whether you are uh, greeting people in the parking lot or you're behind a camera or you're here on the platform uh, worshiping or worship team or band or whatever, that there's something coming out of you that is real. It's not fake. It's real. Why? Because, hey, I've been with Jesus. Do you know in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God created Adam, and the, when the word of God says that God breathed into Adam the breath of life. That's the spirit of God. That's what makes us different than animals. Is, it's called the ruach, or the breath of God. See, I think when we spend time with Jesus, do you know what happens to us? We have this breath of fresh air that is in each of our lives. And guess what? When I come into contact with people in the nursery or in Grace Kids or Grace Students or maybe at the food pantry or on serve day and they interact with me, what do they feel? <sighs> when they come into a church service filled with people who are, who are, who are close to God, spend time with God, you know what they feel? <sighs> it's a breath of fresh air. You can't, you can't quite explain it, but how many know you can feel it? John says it's like the wind that blows. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going, but it's there. It's life. And so that's what we want. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we love God? Well, you've got to develop your closeness with God. And so individually, what, I, what I'm challenging you to do is, is let's make sure that we are regularly studying the Bible. And so at our church, we challenge everybody every year to do a Bible reading program. Uh, and so most of the time, it's the one-year Bible. We'll start January 1, and we'll, we'll do Facebook groups and reading guides and things like that because we want everybody to be reading and studying the Bible. Uh, personal prayer. And we have prayer guides, that, that, a prayer book that we've created. As a church, we always do 21 days of prayer and fasting in January, And of course, this year, we're doing three days a month in prayer and fasting. What are we doing? We're working on our our closeness. We're drawing close to God. And then we want uh, to develop our our closeness with God. We also have have to be people who personally worship, which means I don't wait for Sunday to worship. My life is worship. I'm worshiping God uh, every day. Amen? And so if if I'm doing this, then I'm drawing close to Jesus and other people notice. And when I serve, I'm not serving out of obligation. I'm not serving out of duty. I'm serving because there's life in me and I want to share it with other people. I'm preaching better than your amen. All right. 
So if, if I want to love God, I got to develop my closeness with God. I'm also, I'm going to be developing my character as well. Now that, again, that doesn't mean that I'm perfect, but, but as I draw closer to God, he's changing me, he's transforming me. And then I'm developing my calling. So wherever you end up on the dream team, you know, I'm going to learn about that. I'm going to grow in that. I'm going to, if, I, if I'm teaching a class, I'm going to learn how to be a better teacher. You know, if I'm leading a group, I'm going to get trained how to be a better uh, group leader, right? If I'm, if I'm, if I'm, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to develop my calling, okay? Because I love God. So the best thing that you have to offer everybody else is that you love God. And secondly, uh, the culture that we want to create is that we love people, Church is people, right? Church is not a building. The church is people. And so ministry works best when you love people. I was a youth pastor years ago, and there was a young man in my youth ministry who uh, was planning to go in the ministry. He told me, he said, Pastor Wayne, he goes, uh, I'm actually going to be an evangelist. I said, why, why are you going to be an evangelist? He said, because I can't stand people. He said, I just, it's what he said. He said, I just want to travel and preach and leave people. I'm like, brother, good luck with that. (laughs) Because ministry is people. And it's going to be very hard for us to minister to people if we don't love them, right? And so we love people. In Mark chapter 10, the Bible says Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, or they bark orders at them. And their high officials exercise uh, authority over them, but, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Okay? And so it's hard to serve somebody that you don't love. And so we want to be like Jesus. Jesus said, hey, I didn't come to the earth to sit on a throne and tell everybody what to do. He says, I came as a servant, okay, to love people. And so there's a few ways that we can work on loving people. And the first thing is to be a servant. It's just choose to serve. And and here's here's the deal. If we're, going to, if we're going to serve people well, we've got to love them. And one of the ways that we love them is by serving them. Our approach to ministry, again, it's not guilt or condemnation, but I get to serve people. That's the attitude that we want. I get to do this because I get to be like Jesus. Now, another way that we work on this is, is we, be, we're, we choose to be a team player. Now, what that means is, another way to say that is we above me. Now, some people, when they approach uh, ministry or serving, are like, hey, it's all about me doing everything. No, it's better if we do it together. So I choose to be part of a team. And then uh, third, it's really important to focus on being real. Again, growing up in the church, I think one of the challenges that people have with church people is that they're fake. We just tend to be fake. And I think there's real, something real powerful is if we are, uh, if we're just real, you know, and that we don't pretend like we're perfect because we're not. We don't always pretend like we have it all together because we don't, but we're real, okay? And I think, I think that attracts people. I think that draws people. So uh, we love God, we love people, and third, as a team, we pursue excellence. We pursue excellence. And of course, this is a testimony of Jesus in Mark 7, verse 37. The Bible says, people were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. So wherever you are serving, let's say you're serving on the administrative team. And so after the weekend services, you're helping to input all the information of the people who attended our services. Guess what? People rely on that. We rely on that information to follow up new believers. We've people who want to join a group. That information is very important. So guess what? We want to do that well. You know, we want to spell the names correctly. We want to get the addresses correctly. Why? Because that doing that well depends on the rest of the ministry happening. 
okay? And so we do things with excellence. Now, so what does that look like? Well, everything that we do, we, we're trying to be like Jesus, we do it well, right? If I'm serving on a serve team and we go out to mow somebody's grass and break leaves, uh, maybe of a widow, guess what? I'm gonna do it better than I would if it were my own house. I'm preaching again. <laughs> All right? Why? We do it with excellence because we serve a God of, of excellence. So whatever we do, let's do it well. Let's not be half-hearted. Let's, not, uh, let's, let's, let's take care of people the way we'd want to take care of ourselves. All right? Do unto others. You guys remember that verse, the golden rule? So let's do things well, and, and, and then let's do them before you're asked. You know, we're looking for people on our team that it's not just waiting for somebody to ask them to do something. If you see a need... Meet it, right? You don't have to ask permission. Just go do it, you know? Uh, I tell my team all the time, if you walk by the hallway and there's a piece of paper laying on the ground and you don't pick it up, something is wrong. You don't need to, be, you don't need to ask permission to do that. Find a need and meet it. And, and, and the reality is this is powerful because instead of just two eyes or 20 eyes looking around meeting needs, we've got hundreds and thousands of eyes of course, that sounds like a horror movie, doesn't it? That's so, erase that illustration. But all of us are, are looking to meet needs. And how many know the more needs are met because we're looking around? So do them before you're asked and then do more than is expected. That's, to me, the very definition of excellence. Whatever somebody requires, just do a little bit more than that. That's excellence. You know what? I believe that excellence honors God, and I think excellence inspires other people. I, I like to call it around here, when people come to a service at Grace, they ought to experience what I call the wow factor. Wow. You know, wow in the service, wow in the music, wow in the message, wow in the team, wow in the property, wow in the building. Why, because everything's done with excellence. Again, we're not trying to be perfect for perfection's sake. We're trying to honor God by how we do everything. Man, I'm preaching good today. And that's just the heart. That's the heart that, that God wants for all of us. So as a church, we want to do everything well. All right? Last one. So we love God. We love people. We pursue excellence. And when we're, while we're doing all of it, we choose joy. Matter of fact, in your book, uh, I want you to write down one word right beside this and write down the word attitude. Attitude makes the difference in everything you do. And let me just stop and say, whoever you work for, wherever you go, if you're a student, if you are uh, an employee or employer, I'm going to tell you what, attitude makes all the difference in the world. Matter of fact, I think attitude is more important than skill. It's more important than academic training. Attitude takes whatever you have and multiplies it times whatever. And so what we do, we do it with joy. And how many know joy is a choice? Joy is a choice. And again, we learn that from the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 this is the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking, and he's, he's going through this list of all these things that have happened to him, and he says, I'm sorrowful, and again, if you read the list before this verse, he's, got a lot to, he's been through some stuff. He's been stoned, not recreationally, with, with rocks, shipwrecked, he's been thrown over the water, bitten by snakes, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff that makes you sad, but look at this, he says, yet always rejoicing. He says, I've been poor, but man, we get to make people rich spiritually. Having nothing compared to the world as far as possessions and material, but man, I possess everything. That's the attitude we want. And we want to be like Paul. I mean, think about, think about Paul. All right, Paul, uh, we're going to throw you in prison. Would you? You know, I'm almost done with the book of Ephesians. I need to finish, you know, this letter to the Corinthians. And man, I, I wouldn't be traveling so much and I could do that. You know, hey, and would you put me with that, uh, that soldier that was with me last time? Because he was this close to turn his life over to Jesus. Well, we're going to cut your head off. Well, would you? 
you know, because to live is Christ and to die is gain, and I just don't know which one's better, so go ahead. Now, what can you do to somebody with an attitude like that? Nothing. You can't do anything to that person because they choose joy. That's what we want. That's what I want. I want to choose joy. So how do we do that? Let me show you. It starts with being grateful, which starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get this. The God of heaven asked me to be on his team. Come on, go back to grade school. You're out there on the kickball field and the captain of the team and you you get picked last. This is not God. The the God, the captain of the most awesome kickball team of all time, says, "I want you on my team. I want you on my team. I want you on my team. We get to be on the team. That's awesome. And I'm grateful because you know a lot of us, our story before we were saved, man, it wasn't good. We were hellions. We were broken. God found us when we were nothing." He restored us. He pulled us out of the pit. He redeemed us. He gave us a purpose. You see, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. Are you kidding me? I get to come to church. I get to serve other people. I get to pour into the lives of kids or students. I get to help people who with food insecurity. I get to help provide them a meal. Are you serious? I get to do this. I'm just going to be honest and stop for a second. I can't believe that every week I get to stand right here and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm going to tell you what, that is the favorite part of my job. I get paid for that. It's kind of wrong because I enjoy it so much. But you know what? I get to. And that's the attitude that we want. And And the second way that we choose joy. It's, we just be enjoyable, right? How many know uh, it's just better to be around enjoyable people versus negative people? You know, it's the difference between Eeyore and Tigger. How are you doing, Eeyore? Well, it's going to rain. Versus Tigger. Hey, wonderful thing about Tiggers. Is Tigger the wonderful thing? Whatever. You know, bouncy, 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 all that kind of stuff. That's what Tiggers do best. That's our attitude. We want to be enjoyable. Right? When people interact with us, we want them to have an exchange of life. Now, now that doesn't mean you're always in, in a good place. It doesn't mean you're always in a good mood. But when you are serving, you choose joy. So let's say it's Saturday. And uh, let's say Pastor Wayne has a bad day. You know, whatever. There's weeds in my grass. Sprinkler's not working. I'm talking first world problems. You know what I'm saying? Flat tire happens, you know, and whatever, you know, I don't come in on Sunday morning. Everybody turn in your Bibles, Philippians chapter two, man, I hate this job. You know, nobody's listening. Nobody cares. You're probably not even watching. Guess what happens if I bring that attitude with me? It's going to (laughs) spread. You're like, what in the world kind of church is this? And you're probably not coming back the next week. I can't do that. You can't do that either when we choose, when we serve. We choose joy. We choose to be enjoyable, right? And we choose to be positive. Be positive. Again, we're talking about attitude. Anybody can be negative. Anybody can be negative. All you have to do is read social media, right? Anybody can be negative, but you have to choose to be positive. Hey, man, you know, can you tell me, uh, can you tell me where uh, the Grace Kids are? Well, you know what? Uh, how, how about you let me walk you there, right? You're being positive. You're being, you're being helpful and smiling. And then the last thing is choosing joy is being loyal. And what that means is, you know, you're going to be on the team when things are going great, and you're going to be on the team when things aren't so great. You're going to be on the team when the place is bursting at the seams, but you're also going to be on the team when the government shuts you down in a quarantine and everybody goes online. Amen, everybody. We're just going to be, we're going to stick together. We're going to be loyal. And the result of that is joy. Psalm 100, the Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. That's what we want. We want to serve the Lord with gladness, a smile on our face, serving should bring joy. And that's what we want. And of course, at the end of the day, why are we doing all of this? Why do we serve people? Why am I on a dream team? Why 
Why do I show up? Why do I bother? I'm not getting paid for this. Why would I bother to lead a group? Why would I, why would I bother uh, to, uh, to be on a soundboard backstage so that other people who are watching online can have a good experience? Why would I do all of that? Well, it's because of Matthew 25. It's because of this day that's gonna happen for all of us. There's gonna be a day that you and I are gonna stand before the Lord. And we're going to give an account of our lives. And the Bible says that we're all going to be judged for the life that we lived. And we're going to be rewarded for the things that we did. And see, when I stand before the Lord, and when you stand before the Lord, here's what we want to hear. Good job. Good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. So I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Here's the deal. Why do we do what we do? We do it for Jesus. We do it because we're grateful of what God's done for us. And we do it because there will be a day when we're going to be rewarded for every good deed that we did in his name. Every diaper changed, every cup of cold water that we gave, every, every person that we listened to as they poured out their hearts to us, right? Every time we showed up early, to get a building ready for a service, right? Every time I went out to mow somebody's, well done, well done. That's the day I'm living for. Hopefully that's the day that you're living for as well. If we live our lives for ourselves, we're not gonna hear well done. We're gonna hear something else. I wanna hear, good job, Wayne. That's what I wanna hear. And that's what I want for you too. I don't want you to live your life for yourself and at the end of the day feel empty about it. I want you to live your life for Jesus. Live your life in fulfillment and serving other people. And then when our our lives are over and we stand before the Lord, you know what? I want to be there when you are. I want to be there when they call your name. And and I just want to stand there as your pastor say, good job. After Jesus says, good job. I'm going to say, yeah, they were with us. Isn't that great? Can you see that? That's what it's all about. Now, let's, let's close with this. Uh, because uh, we, we started this by talking about the fact that you are a leader, that we are all leaders. And so as leaders, we have to choose the right attitude. We have to choose to approach leadership in a certain way. And so we've created this leader declaration that really uh, encapsulates or, or, or grasps the attitude, the spirit that we want. So I'd like you to read this out loud with me, and then we're going to pray, and, and then our facilitator is going to come and, and lead you through uh, the end of this. And then in our next class, we're going to begin to talk about what kinds of teams that you can join. But everybody say this with me, because God has called me to serve my generation, everybody say it out loud, I will value worship over wealth, we over me, character over comfort, service over status, and God's purposes over possessions, positions, popularity, and pleasure. To my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer in advance is yes. Wherever you lead and whatever the cost, I'm ready anytime, anywhere. I want to be used by you in such a way that on that final day, I'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in and let the eternal party begin. Jesus, we want to be ready for that day. And God, we pray today that all of us would get your heart for serving people. We pray, Lord, that you would infuse us with the joy of the Lord, the same joy that Paul wrote about in his letter. And God, we pray that you would give us a vision to serve people the way you serve people. Lord, that we're not lording it over people or exercising an authority, but God, we actually get to serve. We thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for giving us freedom. Thank you for creating us on purpose. And God, may we show our gratitude to you by the way we serve other people. In Jesus' name, amen.